And so now we're going to deal with the anima. And the anima, again, this refers more to uh, the male psyche, right? The male psyche in relationship to the feminine. And so we've got a, a projection here of Audrey Hepburn, who I can honestly say is a bit of an anima for me. She's, she's a lovely, lovely actress. So, so this, is, this is a clip from a film called uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And in this film, it's describing his experience of seeing the anima. So he sees the anima, and then he goes into this total fantasy of himself as the ideal ego. You know, he's this heroic figure, and, uh, you know, he rescues her, and it's, you know, it's quite drawn out. So this is, you know, this is an example of the, the kind of relationship that the male ego can have with the feminine anima in the unconscious. <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is a great clip, right? Because it, it shows us the experience of a of a male, especially a young male, you know, and, and these fantasies that he has about this ideal feminine, right? So the anima is the personification of all feminine psychological tendencies in a man's psyche, such as vague feelings and move, prophetic hunches, receptiveness to the irrational, capacity for personal love, feeling for nature, and last but not least, his own relationship toward the unconscious collectively. In its individual manifestation, the character of a man's anima is, as a rule, shaped by his mother. So that's to say that the first experience of a young male is of mother. Mother is the world. And this is the, the image of the sacred goddess, you know, this, this idea of the, you know, the, the sacred world goddess, Mother Earth, you know, this kind of mythic form, where the mother cares for the child in every way. And for the, for the young infantile boy, his entire libido is directed towards the mother. And this really will have a huge impact on basing and, and building the foundation for the young boy's relationship towards women, and even his relationship with himself later on in life. So if he has a bad experience of the mother, you know, this is a mother that didn't really want the child, maybe, you know, the, you can find this in men later on as irritable, depressed moods, uncertainty, insecurity, and touchiness. The anima repeats, I am nothing. Nothing makes any sense with others. It's different, but for me, I enjoy nothing. This negative anima appears in dreams as a death demon, the French femme fatale. Right, so this is this is the man. This is the man who had a negative experience of his mother, and you see a lot of men like this. They have no feeling relationships. They have no feeling uh, experiences with with life. Life is a very cold, uh, cold and, and factual experience for them, and so there, there's no projection. There's no intimacy. Very little life in the psyche. If the if instead the young boy has a good experience of his mother, perhaps even too good, he can become effeminate or perhaps preyed upon by women, and thus is unable to cope with the hardships of life. This sort of an anima experience can turn men into sentimentalists, or they may become as touchy as old maids. The effect of this anima is shown in all those neurotic, pseudo-intellectual dialogues that inhibit a man from getting into direct touch with life and its real decisions. He reflects or thinks about life so much that he simply doesn't live it. And I can honestly say that when I was younger, this was definitely me. I had a, a really caring mother, a really caring grandmother, and I struggled as a young man to overcome these effeminate qualities. And in fact, in my testimonial video, the one that I did uh, just most recently here, talking about when I broke up with Sarah, this negativity that came out of me was so profoundly powerful because I had such a slant in my psyche towards being incapable of dealing with the hardships of life. You know, as a young boy, if you're coddled by your mother too much, then you become, uh, you know, very, very resentful to life because life doesn't appease you. It doesn't take care of you like mom did, right? And this can create a lot of toxicity in the psyche. So what we need is, of course, a healthy balance between these two opposite extremes. And you can see this in men, in the different relationships that men will have. So the anima is responsible for the fact that a man is able to find the right marriage partner. The anima will function in helping a man pull up or dig up hidden facts about his psyche. She enriches the man's life with beauty and vitality, feeling for nature, sensitivity, compassion, and spontaneity. The most vital role played by the anima is her ability to put a man's mind in tune with the right inner values. This functions to open the male ego up to the call of the self.
She functions as a guide to the unconscious and leads the male ego deeper into the psyche, calling him to personal fulfillment. We see this played out in the role of Beatrice in Dante's Paradiso. The role of the anima is to function as mediator between the ego and the self. So really, you know, what's being described here is that it, it, it's essential to understand that the male's relationship with the sacred feminine, the male's relationship with this feminine image within his mind, has a direct impact on his relationship towards his spirituality, his relationship with God, his feeling relationships, every aspect of his intuitive life is really built on this relationship with this feminine aspect of himself. This is, this is so key to understanding male psychology. The anima, likewise, will follow four stages in her development. The initial phase is the erotic phase, and this is, of course, started in adolescence when a young boy is first experiencing uh, th this, this projection. I mean, at the beginning, the anima is formed by his experience of his mother, but then around the ages of 13, 14, 15, suddenly his libido will turn away from mother, sometimes in a very aggressive way, and it will then go directly towards other young girls around his age. And this is the experience of the awakening of sexuality. And as the young boy grows up, you know, and he, he gets a little older, his romantic feelings will begin to develop. Now, again, this is directly proportional to his experience of his mother. And many men never reach this phase. They, they will never reach the romantic phase. They, you know, the idea of romance never impacts them at any time. And so this is, this is represented largely, uh, you know, in the symbol of Romeo and Juliet, right? Finally, this is when we enter the third stage, and this is love, uh, libido, eros, and this is really the male who has matured, and so he, he is raised up out of the erotic and becomes orientated towards spiritual devotion, so the Virgin Mary or Quan Yin or the Buddhist. So this is a phase in which the male recognizes the anima, this ideal feminine form that he's been pursuing since his youth, to be a spiritual truth, rather so much a uh, physical material truth. And this is a major development, a very hard stage to overcome. And finally, if he can go even further, he will arrive at the final stage, which is to recognize the anima as wisdom incarnate. Open, out in the or out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. That's from Proverbs 1, verse 20. Hagia Sophia, you know, in, in uh, the Christian tradition, Christ was referred to as wisdom. Well, in the Old Testament, wisdom is a feminine figure. So you could talk about Christ as much as, uh, as a woman as you can a male, which uh, I think may come as a shock to a lot of people. The, uh, the, in the East, in the Orient, they have Prajna Paramita, which is a female kind of goddess figure who is responsible for containing and maintaining the, uh, the mythology uh, of wisdom. She is, she is the book. She is the wisdom teachings of the Buddha, the incarnation of his insight. And so the male has to recognize the spiritual forms of wisdom to be the ultimate uh, holy expression of the sacred feminine within himself. Here we have Hagia Sophia. This was at one time the largest church in the world. It's built in Constantinople, which unfortunately was conquered by the Muslims, and it's been since turned into a mosque. But uh, this idea of God as sacred feminine here, as, as Mary, you know, and, and the Christ child himself as the feminine wisdom incarnate, represents that this is, this is a deeply uh, symbolic notion that we find great expression of in Christianity. And here, of course, we have Prajna Paramita, wisdom perfection. She holds the books of the wisdom of enlightenment. In the Catholic tradition, uh, Nuestra Madre, uh, our Holy Mother, you know, I, I actually had the pleasure of going down and seeing Our Lady of Guadalupe on her feast day. And to see the crowds of people to come out and pay homage to this image, you know, to this, to this uh, representation of the sacred feminine, it's, it's really beautiful. These were some photographs that I actually took myself when I was there. And you can see the, the outpouring of religious feeling towards this, you know, which is rather, it's rather controversial because you have to consider that these are Catholics and ultimately their commitment is to Christ. But you can definitely see that the sacred feminine in the form of the Virgin Mary has found great and beautiful expression within the Catholic faith. And then we have Kuan Yin, and this is the incarnation of Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion, a symbol of the sacred feminine within the Orient, within the East. Here you have some more images of Kuan Yin, beautiful iconography. Now this is a short piece out of the, the movie The Lord of the Rings, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, and it's the scene when Arwen comes in and, and sees Frodo. And I can honestly say when I was a teenager, this movie came out, and I think this was the first moment that I had... Uh, you know, watching this film, it was a kind of rapture that came over me. 
And uh, it was the idea of this sacred kind of pure female energy that was just so compelling. I remember, you know, watching this scene and being really moved by it. So we'll, we'll give it a watch here. And I want you to try and pull out the, the, the sacred feminine, the, the, the goddess-like imagery that comes through here. Yeah, beautiful scene, you know, and it, and it captures this, this idea of the, of the sacred feminine quite nicely. So here we have the sacred feminine as Mother Nature, you know. So I'm going to read for you guys here. This is a, a letter that was sent by Chief Seattle to the President of the United States. And this was at a time when the Americans were coming out into the, into the native uh, country. And uh, he writes this letter to the President and it says, The President in Washington sends word that he wishes to buy our land. But how can you buy or sell the sky, the land? The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, how can you buy them? Every part of the earth is sacred to my people. Every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every meadow, every humming insect, all are holy in the memory and the experience of my people. We know the sap which courses through the trees as we know the blood that courses through our veins. We are part of the earth, and it is part of us. The perfumed flowers are our sisters, the bear, the deer, the great eagle, these are our brothers. The rocky crests, the dew in the meadow, the body heat of the pony and man all belong to the same family. The shining water that moves in the streams and rivers is not just water, but it is the blood of our ancestors. If we sell you our land, you must remember that it is sacred. Each glossy reflection in the clear waters of the lakes tells of events and memories in the life of my people. The water's murmur is the voice of my father's father. The rivers are our brothers. They quench our thirst. They carry our canoes and feed our children. So you must give the rivers the kindness that you would give any brother. If we sell you our land, remember that the air is precious to us, that the air shares its spirit with all the life that it supports. The wind that gave our grandfather his first breath also receives his last sigh. The wind also gives our children the spirit of life. So if we sell our land, you must keep it apart and sacred as a place where man can go to taste the wind that is sweetened by the meadow flowers. Will you teach your children what we have taught our children, that the earth is our mother? What befalls the earth befalls all the sons of the earth. This we know, the earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man did not weave the web of life, he is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. One thing we know, our God is also your God. The earth is precious to him, and to harm the earth is to heap contempt on its creator. Your destiny is a mystery to us. What will happen when the buffalo are all slaughtered, the wild horses tamed? What will happen when the secret corners of the forest are heavy with the scent of many men, and the view of the right hills is blotted out with talking wires? Where will the thicket be? Gone. Where will the eagle be? Gone. And what to say goodbye to the swift pony and then hunt? The end of living and the beginning of survival. When the last red man has vanished from this wilderness, and his memory is only the shadow of a cloud moving across the prairie, will these shores and forests still be here? Will there be any of the spirit of my people left? We love this earth as a newborn loves its mother's heartbeat. So if we sell you our land, love it as we have loved it. Care for it as we have cared for it. Hold it in your memory, the memory of the land, as it was when you received it. Preserve the land for all children and love it as God loves us all. As we are part of the land, you too are part of the land. This earth is precious to us, and it is also precious to you. One thing we know, there is only one God, and no man, be he red man or white man, can be a part. We are all brothers, after all. So this is a, a beautiful uh, letter, you know, that, that King Chief Seattle uh, sent to the President of the United States. And, uh, you know, it, it really, it expresses this sense of the sacred feminine. He's talking about the, the nature 
of this world as being something more than just inanimate objects. I mean, the, the white man, the Western man, <clears throat> he thinks so logically, he thinks so uh, egotistically that he's completely lost any feeling relationship that he has towards the anima, and therefore, as a direct consequence, he's lost all of his feeling relationship towards the natural world. And this is really where the sacred feminine plays an essential role, you know, to have compassion even on the little things. <clears throat> 